Hi, I'm Kathy Mielhauser with the Huron Historical Society and the Huron Public Library. Today is Friday, April 10th, and I'm interviewing Harry Kennis for the Huron Oral History Project. Hey, Mr. Kennis, can you tell us where you're from? I am from Huron, Ohio. Did you grow up in Huron? I uh, was born in Huron, graduated from high school in Huron. And uh, at that time, the uh, Depression was on, and there was not any work in here, and I couldn't find a job, beg, borrow, or see what. And I finally went on the lakes for, Great Lakes, for about five years, four years. And uh, from there, I... You did what? Do you want to know what mm -hmm. I did then? Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I, I was on the lakes for that three, four years. What did you do and on the I, lakes? I, I served my apprenticeship for marine engineering. I started as a coal pastor, took, got a job as a fireman, worked as an oiler, and got a chance to be in the dining room instead of the mess hall when I ate lunch. <laughs> and um, uh, that I, 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 then I had to serve so much time so I could write for my license. And in the meantime, I um, uh, met my wife and she said if we're going to get married you got to get a better job a different job not a better one a different one she said because you were gone all the time gone all the time yeah so i, I went to work for heinedal paper company over in sandusky as a apprentice electrician and i, I worked there until 19 let's see from 1937 to 42 and uh the city electrician came to me one day and said there's going to be a new business come in and he said, the job you've got now, uh, the, the, the chief electrician has got two kids that are coming along and they're going to be senior to you in terms of longevity. He said, I've got a, they're, they're going to be looking for an electrician. And I told him I got one for him. And that was me. I wasn't sure I wanted to do that because this is a depression period. And I said, I've got this job. I don't know what that one's going to have. And I don't know if it's going to be worth it or not, you know. So I stalled off. And, in the meantime, the city electrician waited about three, four weeks and went in to talk to my boss. Then he came back out and he said, I want you to go over and get an interview to <laughs> that job over there because I think you should go. And he said, I've already talked to your boss. So I said, okay. So I got the interview and I came back and um, I said, I better talk to my boss. So I walked in, John, it's me, you know, John Ungrish. Uh, I got a little story to tell about that before I get to it, because when I got my job with him, uh, I walked, he walked in the office and he said, sit down. And he's a, a little Dutchman about that high and a nice big beer belly on him, you know, and a nice, nice guy. And we got talking about what I had done and all the experience and so forth. And uh, he said to me directly, he said, Harry, what do you know about electricity? Now, this is depression time, and I'm saying all kinds of things. I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can lie to him, tell him I know something about electricity because, and I, but I wanted this job, and I finally said, well, uh, John, I don't know a damn thing about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, on the lakes, I have AC current. We dynamo uh, made our own current and everything, and I had experience for that. But that's nothing like he was talking about. And I knew that, so I told him, I didn't know anything about it. He said, you're hurt. <laughs> I, I almost had a heart attack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he said, now I can make you the kind of electrician I want you to be. And I learned one thing there that I remembered the rest of my life. When you talk to somebody, you tell it like it is. You can't, you can't buff your way too far. So where did you end up going to work then after mm -hmm. Hind and Doubt? Where did you end up where did you end up going to work then? Then I went to work for what they called Automatic Paper Machinery Company. By the uh, and I worked for a fellow by the name of Mike Shenago, who uh, over the years I, I worked for him from nineteen forty two to nineteen forty nine. Uh he left a couple of years before that because he, he didn't have a good relationship with Scott Paper Company. He wanted his own business. And, 
But he is the fellow that set me on the track to success in my business. So what did you end up doing then? Well, I, I um, was over there, at electri started electrician, and this, this was in the pre-operation days. It was all the building and the installation and everything. And uh, when we started up, uh, <laughs> he made me a production manager. <laughs> and uh, I, I, that, that's the title I had when Scott Paper Company bought out in 1945. And um, when they bought out, uh, Mike gave me the job of introducing them to everybody and talking with them and so forth. So I got to know those fellows pretty good. And uh, when they took over, this was 1945, then 1949, they shipped me to Hoboken to troubleshoot the plant there, and uh, I, which I did. And then I worked there two years, and they sent me down to the, the, the big plant in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania, as a methods manager. And then uh, I, I had, at that time, in, in three years, I had seven different jobs. So all these but were they, for but Scott they, Paper? They, they were, they were, yeah, this is all Scott Paper Company. And they, they, they tried to uh, expose me to all the mm -hmm. Scott information. And uh, the final job I had down there was a, a, a temporary finishing superintendent. So did you come back here then eventually? No, well, I, yeah, but then I went to Fort Edward, New York, and the, the, the plant was in the red, and they sent me up there. And uh, I worked there for two and a half years, and they bought the Detroit plant and sent me out there to open that up in the, in the Scott philosophy. And, and uh, I worked there for 12 years, and then they sent me down to Mobile, Alabama. I retired in Mobile, Alabama. And then you came back here? Came back in 1980. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So where did, were your parents from here? Mm-hmm. Where my, did they my live? Mom, uh, my mom was a, a slaker, and uh, that family had uh, three. She had three brothers and a sister. And my, my dad came from uh, Fairport, Ohio, and he was a marine engineer. That's how I got on the. He was on the boat, the boats mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. And his brother was a captain, and in the, on the lakes, and. He had two brothers who were captains on the lakes, and he was an engineer. Where did you go when you were on the lakes? All hmm. over? Well, I'll tell you, one year we spent, we didn't go anywhere else but Duluth, Minnesota, and Buffalo, New York. Back and forth? Back and forth, yeah. All, all were you on long. a coal freighter or an yeah. iron ore? Uh, 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 we, ca we carried uh, coal, we carried iron ore, we carried flaxseed, we carried sulfur. And flaxseed is a, is a, the captain didn't like that because you get in the sea and that, that shifted so fast, it's so slippery, you know. And we, we had a couple of scares, but. Did you fun. like working on the lake? I, I was going to make a career out of it, and, and uh, that's when uh, my wife said, if we're going to get married, you've got to get a different job. <laughs> and I guess she was pretty smart. Was your wife from Huron? She was a uh, uh, and. Uh, Pretty well known group of people. Yeah, very nice lady. So, did you meet her in school, or had you known her for yeah, a while? Yeah, she was a little older than I was, and uh, uh, I told her she was robbing the cradle. <laughs> How much older was she? Two, two years. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, and she, uh, we, we were married sixty-five years. And then she passed away four years ago, four years ago, last February 24th. Did you have children? No, didn't have any. What are your memories of school? Where did you go to school when I you were I went here? to school at Huron High School. Um, I like school. Uh, I got in some trouble and I got, you know. What kind of trouble did you get in? Got kicked out one <laughs> for six months. <laughs> What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't uh, do what the teacher told me to do. Uh, somebody came down the highway and, and uh, somehow or other he tripped. 
And she says, Harry, you get out of the room, you go over to the principal's office. And I said, I didn't do anything that bad. And she said, I'll, I said, I'll go out of the room, but I won't go to the principal's office. What grade were and you in? And that got me in a lot of trouble. What grade were you in? Uh, hmm. I think I was a sophomore. And they kicked you out for six months for that? No, they didn't kick me out. Uh, William Regley was the superintendent at the time. And he could be a hothead. <laughs> but from a teacher's standpoint, I loved the guy. I thought he was a great, I, I took business law, I took all kinds of classes from him, and I thought he was a wonderful teacher. But we got into the, called my dad in, we had a meeting, and he said, uh, I'm going to set up a schedule for you. You're going to stay here in school. And, and we always had a, a class, and then we had a study period, a class and a study period. He said, there will be no study periods. You will find things to take on every hour of the schedule for school life. <clears throat> and you will pass it with a grade no less than a B plus. <laughs> I went home, my dad said, you think you're gonna do another stunt like this? <laughs> I said, no sir. <laughs> but I, I took music appreciation, I took gym, I took uh, every subject I could find that gave me a credit. In, in every one of those, and, and uh, when I walked up in 1934 to get my diploma, uh, Mr. Wigley came up and shook my hand and said, Harry, I didn't think you'd make it. And I felt that big. <laughs> you know what I mean? Good for you. <laughs> yeah. So what was here in life back then when you were growing up? A very small, uh, uh, not, not much future time for people in jobs. Uh, they had the docks, uh, they had fishing. I can remember fish boats come in and, and uh, they, they would, uh, there would be about that much from the water coming over the side of the, and they were loaded with fish, just solid, all kinds of fish. Uh, they had um, a sour, two, two sauerkraut factories. Two? And I worked in one of them. And, uh, and where were they? Well, uh, one was right here in town, and I, I'm not, uh, the owner lived right next to the funeral parlor to the north. Mm -hmm. And I'm, his name escapes me, but, and the other one was across the, the river. And uh, uh, Thelma's dad, my wife's dad, used to raise a lot of cabbage, and he s sold the cabbage to both of them, you know. And where did he live? He lived out on, on Berlin Road, uh, Berlin Sproul Road. He had, a, he had about 60, 65 acres, and right back of him, her brother had another 60 acres over the river road. So they owned the whole section between river road and Berlin road. Mm -hmm. And I used to, when we were married, we got back from our honeymoon, and uh, on a Sunday, my, my mom and dad had us in for chicken dinner, and the phone rang, and uh, Thelma's dad had fallen out of a tree, and and, and uh, it was about better than a quarter of a mile from the house, and he crawled on his hands and knees back up to the porch because there was nobody there with him other than his wife, and, and his wife had arthritis, and she was almost locked up. <clears throat> so, and he broke his back, shoulders, arms, and legs. He was laid up for about three, three and a half years, and he had 12 cows to milk. And uh, everybody, uh, all, the rest of the family all had their, they were married and had their kids, and I was, I'm, I'm the new guy on the block, and so everybody looked around and looked at me. I don't know how to milk cows. <laughs> <laughs> but I, um, I used to have to get up at 3 o'clock in the morning to milk 12 cows, so I'd have it done by 7. And then I'd go to work at 7. Then I'd come home at night and I had to milk cows. And then I decided, when I was doing that, I decided I was going to take night school down at the uh, Western Reserve University. In Cleveland? And, yeah, in Cleveland. So, so I did that three days a week. And uh, 
it was about three and a half years before her dad could get up and around. So we moved right in there. So you and, just moved? And Thelma took care of, uh, of her mother and did the cooking, took, took care of the house, ran the house. And I, I did, when I come home from work, I'd do plowing. And I, I plowed, uh, you know where uh, the, the, the uh, uh, food center is over on Berlin Road? And where, you mean the IG, where, uh, or the Cornells? Uh, drug Mart is and yeah, all those. Yeah. I plowed that whole field. And the road across there, I used to plow it and uh, drag it and disc it and, for her dad. So he owned all that there. Yeah. And then uh, when he got when he got uh, when he got better, uh, oh the cows! I love those cows. You know, you, I get in there and start talking to them, and I whistle to them, and I sing to them, and they have those great big beautiful eyes, you know, <laughs> and they lean over on you like this, you know. And and I used to get a I used I used to get a big pail full of milk. And uh, when, when uh, her dad got back out, and he said, geez, he says, you're getting a lot of milk. He says, Harry, you're a good milker. And I'll tell you something. Coming from him, I said, hey, you know, <laughs> from the kid that didn't know anything about it to this point. And, uh, so did you just use the milk for yourselves? or did uh, We you? used to um, uh, separate it, and uh, we would make butter and take it down to Andrew Smith, and Andrew Smith would sell it. And Andrew Smith We used to was? raise chickens and take take the eggs and take them down to Andrew Smith on Saturday night was a big night. That Who was, was a, Andrew Smith? Hmm? Who was Andrew Smith? He was a, he was a grocery man. And where was his Right grocery? downtown in Huron, right in the middle of Huron. And it was Andrew Smith and then he had a, a, a section that's next to him, Raleigh Hart's Meat Market. There were two were together. And uh, then there was Garrett Drugstore and Harry Morse's Drugstore, Ross Worms Restaurant, Henderson Wilkes on the corner. Yeah, it was a beautiful little town. And then they come along and dug a big hole in the middle of it. So I guess you didn't which like... Which is the biggest mistake in the world, I think. <laughs> so you didn't hmm? like the idea of urban renewal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You didn't like it? No. no. It didn't do anything for Huron. It didn't do, it's a better own community now. And it's, you know, it, uh, <clears throat> it was a nice place because... Gunsnauzer's uh, department store for women and, and some men's clothing. From Gunsnauzer, he had meat. Yale Lavu had the newspapers. Perry Brown had the Chevrolets. Shard had the Fords. You know. Where did you? Where was your childhood house when mm -hmm. you were? Where did you live when you were a child in here? <clears throat> we we lived. Uh, I lived my whole life from, I never got across Cleveland Road <laughs> when I was little, you know. Uh, we lived on uh, uh, William Street, right down next to Null Stockville, and then there was a lake. And right, and right on the other side of us was a great big barn where they used to make nets and tar their nets, and, and I, I learned how to, how to make nets. From those for the guys. fishing boat? Yeah, the and then I go over there barefoot and they chew tobacco and they spit on my feet. How did, <laughs> how did you make the nets? What did you make them out of? They had, they had regular uh, uh, fishing net twine, regular twine. And then they had, and, and uh, these were traps net fishing. Then they had the, the, the uh, other fishing, gill netters. And the uh, trap netters had leads going out into a big mass of, and they had these meshes were set so that the smaller fish could get out. And you only kept the fish that were legal. Of course, when they when they brought them in, there was a lot of small fish in there, and they had to sort them when they when they. What kind of fish them. were they? Oh, there was all kinds. It was uh, uh, perch, a lot of perch, pike, saugers, and we we had a man that was named. So his nickname was Sauger, Sauger Zimmerman. <laughs> Why did you call him that? Huh? Why did you call him that? Well, he, he was a fisherman, and uh, I guess he liked saugers, <laughs> so they call him saugers. <laughs> That's like Gunsnauzer, the meat market man. They call him Bum, Bum Gunsnauzer. I don't know. I don't whether it was a bum at one time or not. I don't know. <laughs> Let's pick up on the... Uh, on the fish? Yes, on the fish. Okay, well... Uh, you, you understand the Huron River comes yes, out from yes. the... The pier, the range light, and then mm -hmm. it comes back, and it used to be the Twain House and the, uh, what was the other restaurant? Showboat. Showboat. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was that was the best one. Mm-hmm. And they, they would come in now. In those days, the showboat wasn't there, and uh, the the other wrestlers up there wasn't there. Oh, they were all wharfs. Um, Albert Matt owned El- Matt Fisheries, and then there was Kissman Fisheries, and then there was Wigan, and there was Bostetter, and there was uh, Zimmerman's, and they all had boats. And then there was Earl and Earl Gow and Bud Blau, and Bud Blau was his son-in-law. They made boats of the size that they used for trap net fishing. And they used to make what time them right, of the right year up was just this? the other side of the river, a bridge where the, you know where the, the railroad track goes over? Right. And right in between there, there was, they made the boats right down there. What time, what years were the? What years is this? Yeah. yeah. It, uh, they could, they, they used to, uh, I think Earl and Bud started, uh, Earl started first. Maybe in the, maybe in the uh, uh, early 20s. And what they do with all the fish then? They took and separated them in big boxes and uh, that had uh, the, the top, there were boxes that were rectangular and uh, wooden boxes. And the, the top had the extension out where you could grab a hold of it. And they would put the fish in there, ice them with layers and uh, cap them up, take them up in the railroad and go either go to New York or Chicago. So they shipped them by railroad then? Mm-hmm. To- didn't have trucks. <laughs> That's true. No, 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 you know, no transportation by trucks, yeah. And then you would help, one of your jobs was to help repair the nets? Didn't they use tar? They used to, they used to, every year they used to come in and retar their nets and then take them out on the farmland that they'd rent and they'd lay them out so that the, it would dry and set up. And then they'd, they'd take them off and then the farmers could plow up their fields. So did they lay them out and then they put the tar on them? No, they would, uh, they would, the, uh, do you know where um, uh, South Street comes into the river? Mm-hmm. Right in that section in there, that section where the, where the, the twine house was, and back to uh, uh, right now there's some houses in right. there. Uh, that section in there was where they set up uh, their tar and they had tanks and had heat. And they would, and then they had racks, and they would dip these in there, and they'd put them on the racks and let them set up. Then they'd take them from there all to the, to the uh, farmlands to, to wash up. What time of year did they do this? Obviously, in the spring. In the spring, before mm-hmm. they tilled the fields, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and all the fishermen would do this. All the different fish houses would, hmm? would you know, do all of it on, at the end of South Street. Then, Mo- yeah, most of that was. Uh, yeah, I don't know of uh, another place here and here and that they did any of that. In fact, we used to go down there and we used to have, uh, we used to choose up sides and we'd get sticks about that long and about that wide and we'd dip it in a tar and we'd throw it at each other. <laughs> yeah, you gotta, you gotta do something. <laughs> <laughs> I wound up with a mess of my hair. <laughs> it, took, it took my mother, I don't know how long, with kerosene and lard to get the stuff out of my hair. <laughs> Hmm, what else did you do as a Mom used child? To say, well, she used to say, all she do is shake your head and say, what am I going to do with you? Did you have other siblings? I had a brother. Is he still no, in the he area? Died, he died about four years ago, uh, brain cancer. And uh, my wife had Alzheimer's for six, seven, eight years. And Now you have to tell me about the donut shop. The donut shop is, it can probably handle, uh, it has a a counter about like this, and there's stools around there, and it's uh, maybe 15, 16, maybe 17, and a couple of It's a young lady by the name of Sherry uh, does uh, the, the, waitressing work and don't drop any crumbs on the floor because she'll tell you about it. <laughs> and these guys come in here, some of these guys come in here, they'll have a time at 8 o'clock. This is a, uh, she opens up at 6. They'll come in at 7 o'clock, they'll come in here at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 
and at 11 o'clock, she closed at 12. Well, some of them will come in at 7 o'clock and go home and come back and <laughs> come back in at midday. So they're regulars. Yeah, and, and uh, uh, you wouldn't believe the things that they argue about. <laughs> you wouldn't. I, I, I pick up uh, Joe Pine, a uh, nephew of mine, and uh, he's got cancer. And we go down there, it uh, takes his mind off it. And uh, they talk about, oh, one day Joe said, hey, I said, I need some corn for my birds. And he's thinking about getting a big basket full of corn. And one of the farmers comes in and says, here's your corn, give him 12 years. <laughs> So it's uh, just a place where everybody gets together and... And uh, everybody, and each of them have their own way, and uh, everybody knows that, and, and if there's a little bit of a question about it, they'll, they'll pick on him, you know, and he got an answer. I went in one day, and uh, it was full. And uh, Sherry blew her whistle, says, well, somebody stand up and give Harry a seat. <laughs> oh, my God. To God. <laughs> I was embarrassed. <laughs> well, she takes care of her customers. <laughs> but she, she's, a, she's a doll, I'll tell you. She does a good job. And what's her last name? Yeah. I don't even know what her last name is. I think it's Payjack. I could be. I think she goes with a Messenberg. A... Yes, she's with Randy. With Randy Messenberg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, you, you know more about it than I do. I think you know more about donut shop <laughs> than I do. <laughs> Well, they're a good bunch but of people. I, I, I enjoy going there, and uh, they'll talk politics, they'll talk basketball, they'll talk football, uh, anything you want to talk about. Motorcycles, <laughs> boats, fishing. Is there anything else about the, the fishing industry in Huron that you can tell us? Kishman used to have a great big building, and in it he had a lot of sawdust. And in the winter time, they used to cut ice, and uh, there there would be there would be ice blocks that thick. Sometimes the the, the it would freeze over, and there'd be 12, 14, 18, 24, 30 inches of ice in the river. Yeah, and and they would they go out and they would um, cut a channel over to the to this building, and they had a conveyor that went out, and uh, they would take these big pieces of ice and they saw them. You know, and they had horses out there on there, and they they'd pull this stuff on, and they had fellows with pike poles that would pull these on in, the, and put them up on this conveyor, and come up into the, the ice house, and they put a layer down, and they put a layer of sawdust, layer down, layer of sawdust, and they had that solid of ice. How long would it stay? All winter, all summer. The sawdust would keep they'd, it. You, you, they'd buy ice out of there all summer. People would uh, people would. They, 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 had, they didn't have refrigerators and they had ice boxes and they'd have them on the porch and then the top they put ice in it, a chunk of ice, you know. Yeah. So did Kishman yeah. deliver it to people mm -hmm. then? Did Kishman deliver the ice or no, would the people come it. and get it? You had to go get it. I, I worked at one time with a fellow named Shirley Woman, had a little stand up there about where, um, I don't know, do you remember where the Yumber Yard was? This yeah. guy at Wickham's place come in there like Freeze, that. Yeah. Right on that corner there, <clears throat> he had a stand. And it was, I was 12 years old. And uh, people come in with their Fords, and, and I'd give them a 50-pound chunk of ice, put it on the back of the truck, on the bumper. <laughs> now, how much would that cost? Uh, there was some that we sold for, let's see, took time. I think 50, 50 pounds, I think, cost a quarter or something oh, like that. You know. And how long would 50 pounds last the average house? Well, uh, if, if they put that 50 pounds there, they could probably get two, three, maybe three days, three, four days in it. So they you could. had to buy it constantly hmm? throughout the summer? Hmm? You had to buy it all throughout the summer mm -hmm. then? Mm -hmm. And there'd be a lot of people come in there every, every day there, and I, uh, I had a lot of fun with it. but. Uh, Lift knows 50 pounds. I, I was 12 years old, <laughs> and it went 100 pounds. You know. Okay. Well, thanks, Harry. I really appreciate it. That was fun.